Today is Thursday, September 14th, 2017. I'm interviewing Dr. Ernest James Harris, who was inducted into the Agricultural Research Service Science Hall of Fame on September 13, 2017. Dr. Harris is recognized for his development of novel approaches to suppress and eradicate the tefferted fruit flies. I'm Susan Fugate. I'm head of special collections and collection management at the National Agricultural Library. It is my honor and also my pleasure to interview you, Dr. Harris. Today we are recording this interview in special collections of the National Agricultural Library. Dr. Harris, would you start by stating your full name and spelling it for us, please? Well, my name is Ernest James Harris. E-R-N-E-S-T, Ernest, James, J-A-M-E-S, Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. Thank you. And we'll start today with um, me asking you to share some biographical information about yourself. Begin as early in your life as you like. Yes. Well, uh, I'm uh, a son of James Harris and Dorothy James Harris, uh, born in uh, North Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, we had a 45-acre farm. And uh, on the farm, our main source of income was a cotton. So we had to plant the cotton and harvest it. And uh, when it was uh, picked in the fall, then it would be sold and the income for the family would come from that source. But the most important part of that was there was uh, six children and my parents were uh, uh, sorry, but say, you, you have to harvest the crop before you can go to school. Because if we hire somebody, then there won't be enough income for us. So we didn't, as children, didn't worry about that. But uh, the downside of it was that uh, we could not uh, catch the bus to go to school. Uh, and so our principal at the high school was aware of this. And so for us, that was the first demonstration of homeschool. Mm -hmm. He came out and talked to us and encouraged us and gave us some, some work so that uh, we could uh, be doing some work uh, with school in spite of the fact that we weren't uh, there initially. Then uh, um, I was prideful of being a good student, so when uh, I was able to go back to school, well, I, would, I would be pretty even with the classmates. So that was the uh, way my parents operated that. And they would always apologize to us saying, we're sorry, we don't, we don't like to have you be out of school, but we just need your uh, support at the present time. And uh, uh, the most exciting thing about that that I recall was that we had a neighbor who would help us sometime with uh, cotton crop uh, production. She could pick 600 pounds of cotton a day. Wow. And, and the, top, the best I ever did was 200 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it was pleasant uh, uh, going out with my uh, siblings and uh, always had a strong imagination. I didn't talk a lot, but I would be thinking about things and uh, I was always thinking of well, what it would be like if I go way away uh, mm -hmm. and so that is really the beginning of what led me to be in uh, Hawaii in the first place. But uh, uh, it was pleasant uh, life uh, for me and uh, it's just that uh, there were some economic limitations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I read um, a touching story about you working in the garden with your mother and how oh, she yes. <laughs> worked on the eradication of insect pests. Can you tell a little bit of that story? Uh, she, she was uh, actually a pretty smart uh, lady and could have done you know, a lot more things than 
she had the opportunity to do, but she uh, would, uh, we would plant the uh, cabbage crop or whatever crop, and, and, and uh, in the spring of the year, that was important because most of the time, up to that point, you'd be eat, we'd be eating dried fruit, you know, potatoes and beans and things like that. But then uh, when the spring would come, then we'd plant uh, uh, turnips and cabbage, mm -hmm. and, and we'd always look forward to uh, harvesting that first crop, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it was a pleasant uh, change in the diet. And so um, I would be out there with her sometimes, and she said, when you are working out here, pay attention to the plant. If you see holes in the leaves of the plant, that usually means that there's a insect chewing on that somewhere. And so the, the trick is you look and you find that and you put them in this jar. She had a mason glass jar there. Mm -hmm. She said they can, they, they can crawl, but they can't crawl out of this jar. And so she just took that around and we would search over the plant when we see holes in the leaves. And uh, most times the insect would be down there nearby and we just drop them in, mm -hmm. in the uh, glass jar. So that became kind of how I approached uh, eating, dealing with the insect problems was pay attention to that and sometimes a simple way of uh, dealing with the problem is, is easy and uh, uh, helpful in uh, solving uh, crop problem. There. So that was what she uh, taught me was to pay attention and, uh, and use that information for benefit to ourselves. And it sure yeah. paid off. Didn't yes, it, it sure did. <laughs> Can you talk about your education beyond high school? Well, uh, when I finished uh, high school in 1946, May 1946, it was uh, toward the end of World War II, and the veterans were coming home from the war. And uh, there was a benefit, uh, educational benefit, called the GI Bill that the uh, head coach had earned and was entitled to. And uh, when I finished high school, th that particular bill, the World War II model of it, was uh, ending. and uh, it, to me seemed to have had a little better educational benefit. So I said, I gotta, I gotta join the Marines before uh, uh, this bill expires. So they came around and said to uh, us that uh, you, the Marine Corps is oversealing, meaning they have more men than Congress had okayed for them to have. And if you want to get out now, you can get out at the convenience of the government. Well, I had been in the Marine Corps uh, by that time one year in a little boy, and uh, I was hoping to do something exciting. And, uh, I always had an interest in airplanes, and, and especially when we were harvesting cotton and uh, three transport planes came flying by at a low level. Uh -huh. And that was, that was really exciting. And uh, that kind of uh, experience really excited me. And then I thought, oh, the closest I can get to that without uh, leaving the ground is I can buy a motorcycle. <laughs> and uh, the, the way they handle and all is very much like an airplane. So I thought, well, then that, that is something I can do. But uh, the chance of my, you know, being able to go to Air Force, or it was, I didn't, I didn't see that at all. But the opportunity to get education from the GI Bill, I could see that. And so I went to the Marine recruiter, and uh, uh, they gave me the tests, except that the uh, sergeant looked at my feet. Oh, you have flat feet. And uh, I said, well, I don't, I don't have a problem with them. Then uh, he took me to the lieutenant, and the lieutenant said to me, do your feet hurt? I said, no. Then, he said, then they said, send him on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, off to Montford Point I went. So uh, African Americans were at Montford Point, 
and Cajuns were at Hadnot Point in, in North Carolina at Lejeune uh, uh, Marine Base. And after uh, basic training, uh, we were put into an artillery outfit, 40 millimeter cannons. We would go on the seashore and shoot those to uh, become proficient at uh, using a gun. Then word came down that, uh, oh, you, you guys are now a uh, uh, company that uh, we will, see. you go over to Hadnot Point and you work in the warehouse, you clean the rifles and do things like that. I started scratching my wow, from artillery to this? <sighs> and, and so when they said, oh, you, you can get out, then I thought, well, if this is all I'm going to look forward to, I might as well head down this other route and get the training. So I got out and, and, and uh, uh, started going to college. And uh, I have a sister who was a year younger than I, and so I used some of the, the GI Bill that I received to help pay her tuition. And we went to uh, Agricultural Mechanical and Normal College, a land-grant black institution in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. So we went there. Then uh, after I had uh, been at school for three years, I, my major was biology and minor in uh, chemistry. The Marine Corps sent a team out to get some recruits for officers' candidate training. So I volunteered to do that. I said, I, I, while I didn't stay in according to my original contract, that doesn't mean that I'm against you. It's just that I, I couldn't see uh, the benefit to me in that. So they examined me and they said, oh, you know, oh, you, you, your eyes, you can't see well enough or something like that, they said. I said, okay. Uh, so I went and finished and got my uh, bachelor's degree and with a minor in chemistry. And, but while I was a student uh, at uh, this college, I had a good friend. I'm in agriculture and he was in mechanic uh, arts. They had a program where you go in your machine shop and you learn how to make various things like that. That was his interest. Mm -hmm. So he left school after three years and went to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, uh, and he bought himself a Harley Davidson motorcycle. So he came back and so he stopped by to see me. And uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, I'm going back to Milwaukee now and, and you, can, you can go with me. I said, okay. I got my bag and got on there and off we went. And I, my parents were standing there. Oh, they were, they were really uh, <laughs> unhappy and frightened and all of that at the same time. But uh, so we left and we got to Wisconsin. Okay, no problem. Then, uh, uh, since I had a chemistry uh, minor, I started looking for a job and uh, I was able to get a job at a company called Malleable Iron Manufacturing. They made uh, uh, products, uh, iron products, and their products were distinguishable by being able to stretch before they break. Oh. And uh, my job was to do uh, chemical analysis of the uh, ore while, of the, or while it was in the furnace, and then they could make adjustments mm -hmm. in uh, uh, eat ingredients in there to get the quality of uh, product they wanted. And so uh, I did that for a while. Then I bought a motorcycle. And so, uh, but I, did, I didn't buy a Harley Davidson. I bought a British motorcycle and, uh, and uh, learned. Then the dealer came and showed me how to uh, drive it around the neighborhood once. And then after that, I was on my own. So from that mm -hmm. point forward, I, could, I, I, I dealt with it. But, uh, uh, then, then uh, I took long rides, and sometimes I wonder now if that might, might have had an impact later. Uh, I would get on there and uh, like to go from 
from Milwaukee to Chicago, yeah, that's pretty easy. But uh, I didn't stop at a motel when I would <laughs> go to uh, these long distances. And so sometimes now I think that might have, uh, uh, I might have a little bit of uh, leftover from that. But in, anyway, it was, it was very joyful. And uh, uh, it, gave me joy, you know, to ride and so forth. And then in the summertime, we'd ride, and in the wintertime, we would uh, stack the motorcycle away. Then uh, I went uh, on vacation to uh, Arkansas to ride my cycle, and I took my mother and father for a ride oh, around the goodness. block. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, then the machine broke down. At that time, the, the transmission and the motor were bolted together. But see, when I was doing the ride, I'm supposed to have a wrench and keep checking the, yeah. the tension on the, on the and, I, and I, didn't, I didn't think about that, and so I couldn't ride it back. Then I went to the train station to leave to go back to Milwaukee. And uh, there was a young man there who finished college with me. And uh, that was a lady, a girl there, Betty Jo Hawkins, who later became my wife. Mm -hmm. She was going to Milwaukee. And then when the train got to Chicago, all the Milwaukee people were all put in the same coach. And uh, so she was going to visit a friend. So I, I took time uh, after we arrived to uh, Milwaukee to help her uh, make contact with a friend. I knew Milwaukee really well from, you know, mm -hmm. riding the cycles. And so we met and uh, she's now, she's my wife. We've been married 60 uh, years, so. Wonderful. Uh, uh, she's been very supportive and we've been supportive of each other, I should say. And uh, so after uh, uh, being in Milwaukee, uh, and after we got married, then I thought, well, I should, I should stop, you know, riding this cycle and, and maybe try to do something with a little bit of educational training that I have. So I went to, Mill, to uh, Marquette University and uh, to get a master's degree in zoology to begin to use the uh, ecological, I mean, the uh, educational skills that I have. Uh, then, uh, at Marquette, there was another young man there who was in a program that I was in, and he said he was going to work for the Forest Service during the summer. And I said, well, how do you get a job with the Forest Service? Mm -hmm. Oh, you, could, you will contact Dr. McElhoney in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And so that's what I did. and. Uh, I was then assigned to work with Arnold Drews, who was a forest entomologist, and uh, we worked up in Cass Lake, Minnesota. And when I had that opportunity, then I thought, wow, this is it. This is what I should be doing. I should be working uh, at forest insects and so forth. So from that point on, I talked to Dr. Uh, my advisor there, and asked him if he would help me get into the University of Minnesota. And he told me that he would help. Uh, then then uh, after uh, getting that commitment from him, but he said, uh, you, uh, we'll let you know when you can come and start the school. So uh, in 1947, when that was, uh, the governor of Arkansas was blocking the black students from going to that uh, high school. That was the, the time that I went to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And they said, first, we want you to come and work for us in this forest. They have a forest of uh, private forests. And then you can start the school in the uh, fall of 1947. And, uh, and uh, that was what I did. My job at Cass Lake, I mean, uh, at Cloquet was to go around and make a record of some plants that they had. There were some trees that uh, grew really well, but some of them, the uh, terminal stem had been 
chewed off by the insect, and some had that problem and some didn't. And so my job was to go around and record that information. And then, um, but I had a motorcycle, so I drove it up to, to uh, Duluth, Minnesota, and that was the transportation I used. Then when the fall came, um, I gave that cycle to my brother uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, matriculated at the University of Minnesota. And, uh, and I had you know, a little bit of GI benefits, so I was in that part of uh, the, the campus. They had some housing for the students there. And uh, that was uh, beginning, and I ended up getting a master's degree from the University of Minnesota in entomology. And it was with uh, that training that I was seeking uh, a job with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, but each time that I would see an ad and I would apply, I never would receive any information. I wouldn't receive any acknowledgement at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that was, that was disappointing. Then uh, my uh, professor from college in Arkansas contacted me after I had gotten my, uh, all the training for the master's and offered me a job to teach biology in Pine Love. So I took the job. Yeah. Then the next day, uh, Minnesota offered me a job to be a forest entomologist. My goodness. Then I said, oh, I had committed to my professor that I was going to come. I can't go back on my word. Oh. But my wife, uh, she had a good job in admissions and records. So when I came home and told her, well, you know, uh, we have we have to go to Arkansas. Well, she wasn't she wasn't happy about I that. <laughs> but I said, I'm sorry, I can't I can't turn around and uh, not acknowledge the person who really helped me when it counted most. That just that just don't fit my character. Right. You know? And uh, a few months after that, the uh, Department of Agriculture contacted me all, all the while I had, before I had been trying to get a job, and told me, oh, we have this program out in the Mariana Islands where we're going to eradicate the, these uh, fruit flies, mm -hmm. and we want you to work on that project. And so I talked to the university, and they said, well, uh, huh, you, you committed to teach here uh, for, for uh, the rest of the term. We're not going to release you from this contract. The only way we will release you is you have to find uh, a person that uh, satisfies our requirements. Then we may then let you uh, leave. So um, I had a, a college, a high school friend. We were, he was a good student. I was too. We competed a lot and. He, he said, oh, I'll take the job. Mm -hmm. And so he took the job uh, at uh, Agricultural Mechanical Normal College. And uh, USDA then hired me and they sent me to Hawaii. Wow. And uh, we were working on this project to eradicate uh, fruit flies. Dr. Nippling, who uh, is as famous, he's, a, he's a mentor and everything to a lot of people. Uh, it was his idea about uh, eradicating using sterile insect method. It had been proven to be effective against uh, screwworm fly, but they didn't know if it would be effective against fruit flies that continued to mate. Uh, uh, and and they they chose me to uh, to work on the project, and they wanted me to go to Guam and receive the sterile flies and release them, and also uh, prepare a uh, lure that was to be dropped from an airplane. And the, the Navy was a supplier of the airplane, and uh, uh, na uh, the Air Force uh, was, uh, uh, well, the Navy flew for us, and, and the Air Force helped by transportation from Hawaii to the Mariana Islands. The, uh, Flies, the sterile flies were produced in Hawaii and in Honolulu and then shipped by air from there to, to Guam. So that was an ongoing rearing of the flies and transport uh, by Pan Am and uh, some by uh, uh, 
Air Force people. And, and that was uh, the, uh, the military coming together because they, they, nobody really believed, can you really eradicate an insect? And my job was to receive the flyers, sterile flyers, put them in the box and, re and go to the, with the Navy pilots to Aroda and release them. And uh, that was one method. And the other method was to uh, use a, a male lure to, uh, with the toxicant to uh, eradicate oriental fruit flies. So we'd melon fly, sterile insect releases, uh, oriental fruit fly, male annihilation, we called it. Mm -hmm. But the site, initial site for male annihilation experiment was the Boning Islands. Iwo Jima, where the Marines fought in, uh, during World War II. But the problem was uh, the Navy uh, twin engine aircraft sometimes would encounter trouble between Guam and uh, Bonins. And sometimes they would go out to make the drop and have to turn around and go back. So finally they decided uh, the, the location for the male annihilation treatments was a little bit uh, problematic because of the distance. So they decided then to do all of the research on Guam, which, I mean, on uh, Rota, which was 30 miles north of Guam. And, uh, and, and, it, and it was successful. And so right. that was beginning my career in entomology. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then the next assignment after that was they had a young man come in who had a PhD already, and he was the one that took over uh, the um, uh, work on, on uh, Guam. And then I was afraid to uh, leave and work uh, in Honolulu, and that was mm -hmm. when I started to do research and ecology and so forth. Uh, again, having some impact from growing up on the farm, I was right. thinking about my mother, how she would think of it. Then I thought, oh, I need to uh, get information about the city of Honolulu so that when we developed uh, technology for fruit fly control, uh, we could do it from an ecological point of view. So uh, I hired an airplane and then uh, he flew all over the island of Oahu and, we and I had two cameras just yeah. making pictures. And, and so uh, with that information, uh, that would help me in planning, help me in developing technology that uh, would be most effective against fruit flies. And so how I approached it and looked at it came from that initial work. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing that happened later, uh, development started taking place. So I ended up having pictures of things that they changed that, that uh, uh, was important. Right. Just, just by chance, it happened to be uh, uh, something that uh, I use, the information I use later. But basically, the ecological, the, in other words, back to my mother again, how she visualized and uh, looked at things, that was how I approached uh, the research that uh, I have been doing uh, uh, for USDA, and of course writing, you know, publications. Sure. Uh, but I didn't have a PhD initially, and the department, uh, at one point, uh, if you went to school to get advanced uh, training, you had to pay for it yourself and take leave. But then they changed the policy mm -hmm. and said, oh, well, no, we want to encourage our, our people to, you know, get uh, degrees. And when they said that, oh, now I've got to, I've got to go into that program quickly as I, I can. And I went to the University of Hawaii committee and they said, well, you can, you, we'll, we'll okay you, you to do that. But at the same time, after the successful uh, implementation of eradication in the Mariana Islands, uh, other countries began to show interest in that. So the uh, uh, Tunisians were interested in having a medfly program, and Moroccans and Algerians. 
but the uh, Algerians, they, they said they were interested, but they, they did not uh, invest much in it, but the Tunisians really, really embraced the program. Mm -hmm. And so I was chosen uh, to work with them, and, and uh, so my family and I, we went to Tunisia, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, after my committee okayed my use of uh, some of the uh, work that I, I was doing in Tunisia for dissertation, then uh, I felt that I could uh, do that. But I also knew that if I took that assignment, it's got to be done in three years. If I don't get it done in three years, it, it may un unravel. In other words, mm -hmm. when I come back from the overseas assignment, uh, to work for the USDA, they may send me to Texas or someplace mm -hmm. else. Right. And uh, there was always a risk that I couldn't go back to the uh, Hawaii. And so um, I set up the program there so that at the end of uh, three years I would leave. And it, that was turned out to be a, a really good move. In mm -hmm. other words, uh, uh, Dr. Nippling and others who had chosen me to work on a project in the Maryland Islands, they, uh, when I got back to uh, USDA, my youngest son who's here with me, he was a uh, baby, pretty young at that time. No, he was a baby before we left to go mm -hmm. to Tunisia. Tunisia. He was a bit older when we came back. But basically, uh, when I came back, the department was completely reorganized before mm -hmm. headquarters here in Bellsville yeah. had engineers uh, in charge of engineers, uh, entomologists in charge of entomologists. Then they changed that mm -hmm. and said, we mix it all up and move the people from Bellsville all, all over. Mm -hmm. And so when I got back, I, I was you and the son back to Hawaii, but it was by the skin of my teeth <laughs> <laughs> that, that that worked out that way. And uh, so uh, uh, I was able to continue to do this work with flies, and that was really exciting, and mm -hmm. things were working out well. And I remember coming to this building when it was, uh, shortly after it was built, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a lady working here that I used to work with to help me with my uh, manuscript writing. Uh, I got, got help from her. Great. And uh, so that's been wonderful. Good. Well, it's a wonderful career yes. and a very yes. important contribution to not only American agriculture but international agriculture. Yes. Well, you've described to some degree ecological entomologist and I think that's an important thing to talk about because yeah. for those um, who are less familiar with the field, they might not know yeah. um, what that yeah. means. But yeah. I think you've given us an idea yeah. yes. of um, not only what that is, but also your inspiration, yes. your mother's work in yes. the garden. Yes. Um, and you've talked about suppression and control techniques. But can you talk a little bit about your work that led to the successful mass rearing of the beneficial wasp? used for control as yes, well. Yes. Well, uh, when I went to Hawaii uh, and learned about fruit flies, I learned that some of the reasons that uh, they were a problem is that tourists would be on ships that visit Hawaii and, and they, when they come from other ports that uh, they would bring along fruit and then uh. when uh, it got to Hawaii, maybe the worms already in it, so they just mm -hmm. threw it overboard at that uh, point. And then the flies would leave the fruit and go f looking for uh, fruit uh, on the island. Mm -hmm. And as a way, as a result of that, uh, new insects were introduced into Hawaii, and that, that created uh, problems for them. So one of the ways they would try and alleviate that problem is go to the country of origin of that species and look for natural enemies mm -hmm. and then bring the natural enemies back to Hawaii and release them. them. 
So the natural enemies would help suppress the population. They won't eradicate it, but right. they would make the uh, problem uh, less serious uh, by losing the numbers of uh, mm -hmm. pest insects. And so that started out really early to be part of the strategy that was used. So uh, uh, entomologists uh, were hired to go explore these various areas and collect the enemies and bring them in and uh, rear them and release them. In other words, instead of the population being up here, right. with the natural enemy would be down low, you know. Exactly. And so uh, that, that was an uh, and, and interest of mine. But th that was one particular natural enemy uh, uh, that attacked the eggs of uh, the fruit flies. And uh, Phopis aurasinus was the name of this uh, particular insect. So uh, uh, that was a, a plant, tropical almond, what we call it. it uh, I always noticed that when I'd go around looking uh, for uh, observations just to learn, this uh, plant grew near the seashore on the shoreline, and it had this fruit on it. And there would always be a large number of the wasps uh, mm -hmm. there, so I could sure I could go collect some and whenever I uh, needed to or wanted some. And uh, just by watching them, uh, I, I developed a, another method uh, where I would take uh, papaya fruit and then I'd take a needle and put a bunch of holes in it and uh, put it out and the, uh, when, when I did that, the flowers would all congregate uh -huh. there so I could collect a good number right. in a, a relatively short period of time. But while at the same time <laughs> looking and watching, trying to learn more about their behavior. So that was uh, uh, how I started to look around at this natural enemy. And then the, the report came down, oh, you can't rear these insects in the, uh, in the laboratory because when you try to rear them, you just end up with males only. You can't get enough females to uh, uh, perpetuate the colony. And that was what they said to me. So I talked to a couple of technicians, uh, one Japanese, one Chinese. I said, what do you guys think about this? Think we can rear this insect? It's natural in the lab? They said, yeah, well, yeah, we can rear it. Uh, so I said, oh, yeah, okay, I think so. I said, I tell you, well, let's, let's try it then. I have no uh, authority to uh, do that, but, but we'll, we'll rear it, and then if we are successful, we just keep it, and at some point we will reveal that uh, uh, we have it and, and uh, show how it can be reared. But when people start to talk about it, oh, I hear your boss is trying to rear this insect. Don't he know nobody ever d did that? <laughs> and uh, uh, so it was a joke, you know. So what I thought about was, okay, what excites males more than anything else? More females. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I did, I said, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do. We'll put one male to one female, one male to four females, one male to eight females in different cages. And then we will rear to see what the outcome will be. And uh, we can continue that. So after like somewhere around 33 or 34 generations of doing that, then we start getting recovery of more females. Okay. So after we got to that level, then I discontinued all the other ratios and just started rearing all that that way, and that's how we got the colony started, and it was it was working. But we didn't say anything to anybody. But I said, in time, we'll we'll uh, reveal that because right now, the people that no way in the world they believe that that they, they got it. No, no, no. That's that's just not possible. So um, after we'd been rearing it four or five years, um, there was a. Uh, Young man who who hired, we hired. He had been he had, he was an Air Force re, a retiree, 
And he told the uh, uh, laboratory director that he could rear this, this parasite. And so uh, I said, we already have it in colony, in mm -hmm. the lab. And he said, no. Okay, if you have it in colony, I'm gonna outline this experiment and, and, and put it to the side. I said, fine, you go ahead and do that. And so when he did that, <laughs> The, the guy who was claiming he could read, his, his methods weren't working, but ours were working like fine. Then he started saying, well, how come you didn't scream and holler about this before? I said, it didn't make no difference. What I did, you guys didn't believe that, it, <laughs> that we could do it. So I just waited until the time came and, and this is it. This, this is for the lab. I didn't just do it for me. I, I did it because I thought it was technology we should have. And then after that, oh, well, then they say, oh, yes. And mm -hmm. So then I got recognition. Yeah, uh, uh, but um, it, was, it, was, it was a wonderful experience and uh, great joy. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have chosen any career that I enjoyed as much as I have. Uh, working with fruit flies and doing work for USDA. Mm -hmm. And then I have to give USDA credit for it because if, if they had not uh, uh, given me that opportunity, you know, it would have never happened. Yes. Yeah, very good. And then uh, the nipplings and all of it seemed to all uh, mess to, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's exactly. wonderful. Can you talk a little bit about some of the bias and perhaps the discrimination that you experienced in your career? Well, uh, you know, having grown up, grown up uh, in the South and so forth, uh, that was always that, uh, that problem. Uh, but after, you know, Martin Luther King's and the uh, sacrifice and all of that happened there, I did not participate in that. What I thought about was that I would, uh, uh, when the door opened to give us a chance, I would focus on demonstrating that uh, uh, we, we can do some good work. And so that was my focus, so I didn't do anything other than that. So. Part of the, what I'd be thinking about when I was working was, uh, you know, going away to other countries, seeing mm -hmm. people, and right. learning like that. And so, that it to some degree is a little bit of difference between my wife and I. I think and don't verbalize a lot, and she thinks and verbalizes all the time. <laughs> so we can't get. Sometimes we out of sync. <laughs> uh, but any, anyway. Uh, uh, but she was always supportive of of, of uh, going my going over, uh, overseas and doing things like that. And but she's still not happy with uh, communication. I still don't talk enough for for her. Uh, because, but that's the difference in us. But uh, how I visualize it is, I do these things like that. And I'm thinking about how to uh, improve, and sometimes. Uh, just thinking about it, I come up, I think of a way to mm -hmm. achieve the goal I wanted to achieve. And so um, that, that is how some of the technology is developed. And, but I, what I, I was thinking about uh, Pan Am aircraft flying uh, uh, to Southeast Asia and all, mm -hmm. I said, I'd like to experience that. And then uh, at the time I started to work, ARS had a foreign agriculture research program. And so when I was working for uh, Fruitfly, I had work that I was doing research on in Hawaii. And then uh, I met some people in Pakistan and I had work going on right. with them. And, uh, we could go and visit Pakistan and Iraq with them there mm -hmm. in that country. Then after two years, they could come and interact with us here in our country. And that was an uh, uh, experience that, that really helped me mm -hmm. 
because then I could see the, the insects that uh, they had the problem with and uh, I could suggest things that they want, may want to try. They su could suggest things that I would want to try. Mm -hmm. And it's from that interaction that I learned. Uh, in, pa in, in Pakistan, there was uh, the Himalayas uh, produce a lot of rainfall and water comes down and floods out an area and people have to leave and mm -hmm. uh, until the water goes down and, and then they come back after that. But uh, we had a project, and uh, there was this young man who was uh, operating traps there, and the, this project would have two vehicles, one a smaller vehicle for operating the traps, and then one had a uh, larger vehicle for transporting people. But the smaller vehicle for transporting traps was driven by a young man, and then they have these roads, two-lane roads, and he he got over there in a passing lane, didn't have enough uh, power to get out of the way, and uh, had a collision and killed himself and destroyed mm -hmm. the vehicle. And so uh, when I visited uh, the station, this young man was saying that he couldn't use the larger vehicle that the administration was using, and he had to uh, operate uh, running traps and doing his work using his bicycle. So I thought about it a little bit. I said, you know, I, I, I can't come here and recommend to these people that they let him use a vehicle. Uh, that, that, that's, that won't work. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, I'll tell you what you do. When you go uh, out to run your traps, in other words, the area would be flooded, then the water would go down, and then after water goes down, there would be islands in the area, and they would plant the crops there. So when you go over to uh, the island, collect some fruit and hold it in a you know, glass jar there. And uh, if any insects come out of there, see, then you take it to your, your balls. And so he did that. And they discovered uh, for the first time these uh, flies that they had never seen before. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that uh, uh, they had this particular insect. So the boss wrote that up and everything. Then I saw him sometime later, and he didn't. He, he, riding and walking was all right if you could make some discoveries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and 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 it's from that sort of thing that 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 I learned, uh, uh, you know, and. So that was the thing that I liked about that, based on you know my mother what she had said to me, and when I uh, was interacting with uh, Pakistanis, uh, we had some research going, and and then uh, later I had a operation with the Egyptians uh, when Nasser was the. Uh, president of mm -hmm. of uh, Egypt, a relation with the U.S. Uh, it, it, it unraveled. But then, when Sadat became the president, I was over in Tunisia, and the opportunity for ARS to start interacting again with a good level with the Egyptian occurred. And they said, mm -hmm. "Well, you go over to uh, Cairo and meet with them and." So I did that, and from that interaction, uh, I uh, d did some research with, with, with the Egyptians. And there was one town, Alexandria, that I visited over there, and they were saying, oh, we have these problems with the insects and so forth. And then I asked them, well, well show me uh, where, uh, the problem is here. And so I went into Alexandria and uh, people had walls and all around the mm -hmm. homes and all of it. And inside of the, uh, this area was uh, fruit trees, uh, vegetables and various things like that. But then when the fall would come, the fruit that was still on the tree would remain there. Then, then I had already learned from working with Moroccans, that if, if the uh, fruit is there 
And it's winter time. That doesn't mean that the insect's dead. That just right. simply means that they're they're still in the fruit. I said you gotta you gotta get rid of all this fruit. You can't mm -hmm. let the fruit stay here from one year to the other. All you're doing is preserving the, the insect problem. And so they removed all of the fruit and Great. and then they said to me, um, uh, uh, where, "Where are you living?" I was living this one place. Oh, uh, we want to move you up to this auxiliary uh, luxury hotel. What? I said, uh, I, I, I can't, I can't do that. I got to have documents showing that I stayed in, uh, and paid, and how much I paid. They said, Oh, don't worry about that. You tell us what you need. <laughs> I said, Well, if you're gonna do that, then what I will do is, I'll buy a gift for my wife, and I'll buy a gift for your wife. <laughs> And so uh, they said, well, okay, 200 dinars, uh, 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 Egyptian pound. And so they gave me a ring and bracelet and so forth for my wife, and, and uh, which she still has. But some of the other things that I bought for her long way, I don't know where they are, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this Alexandrite stuff she still has, in fact, uh, she got frightened uh, at some place. Uh, some guy came up to her and asked her about it, and, but I didn't. I didn't know it was that valuable. Anyway, uh, that that was uh, some of the really nicer things uh -huh. that, that that happened. Uh, Dr. Harris is a recipient of the Congressional Gold Medal. That is the highest civilian honor given by Congress. Dr. Harris was awarded the gold medal for his perseverance and courage while serving with the Monford Point Marines during a time of hardship and segregation. You're also un been honored by many countries and many yes. other organizations. Yes, yes. Your, um, one of the universities you attended. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about an award that stands out to you that had a particularly um, a critical meaning to you? Well, uh, it was all uh, or important, but I guess uh, what uh, causes me to maybe react in the way people maybe think I don't appreciate it is, is that, uh, you know, um, here I am just ordinary guy trying to make it and trying to do some things to be enjoyable to me, but at the same time helpful. And I just feel that, uh, that, that, that's, that was the end that I saw, but I'm happy to, I realized that it had a much, much greater impact than that. And uh, I just don't know how to react to mm -hmm. <laughs> awards and things of that sort uh, because of, you know, the joy of life and uh, opportunities and interaction with people. It's, it's to me, is uh, what is maybe expected at least that's my philosophy mm -hmm. about it anyway. Uh, I'm happy that it, that, it, that it had that impact. And uh, I think it's a good model for, you know, young uh, people to see. And uh, the attitude of that nature of being helpful and so forth is something I think would be a great benefit to our, our country and the world for that matter, but especially now instead of us working more together, it, it, we seem to be in a, in a place where um, it, that uh, we don't exactly know exactly uh, how it should turn out, but I, I always try to have a good model and then work in that direction. And, and I don't know any other way to go about it other than to be humble and uh, thankful 
for, for life and joy and uh, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. I don't know how to be anything else <laughs> other than who I am. <laughs> well, that's good for the world. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Edward F. Nippling, who was one of your mentors, and you've been described as a role model um, for people um, in science, particularly African American people of science. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit more about? I mean, I think you uh, just did to a degree, but... Well, uh, being an African-American, uh, it's always a challenge, and uh, maybe we don't have enough models uh, for other young uh, African-Americans to model after perhaps uh, I don't know <laughs> well I suppose I have uh, ideas about uh, that and I just I feel like we should just continue to look for the best in each other and and when bad things happen don't model uh, after that but try to use it as a model uh, some of the good things that happen mm -hmm. and recognize that uh, people vary, uh, differ in uh, their thinking about things. But I think the model that should be always projected forward uh, is to work with people and uh, nice to people, period, without any concern about who they look like or anything of that sort. That's how I visualize it. And if we all did that, it, it would be better for not only our country, but for the world. I, I agree with you. Yeah. And I think you've proven that yeah. that yeah. method of modeling yeah. successful yeah. behavior yeah. Uh, has made a difference. Yes, so thank you. So are there any questions you'd like to revisit, or is there additional information about your life and career that you'd like to share before we conclude this yeah. interview? Uh, I think of uh, the experiences that I've had with USDA ARS, it, it has opened up uh, for me an avenue of information and experience that I couldn't have had any mm -hmm. other way. Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful to uh, the Nipplings and, and so forth and USDA because uh, if they had not given me the opportunity to work in Hawaii on the fruit flies, I would have uh, been a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, working on the fruit flies and all the experiences that have come with that has been far, far above anything that I ever dreamed uh, otherwise. But it gave you opportunity to teach as well. Yes, yes. And then not only that, but my, my family uh, benefited also. I, I have a daughter. Uh, when we arrived in Hawaii, she was in the first grade. And at that time, the Japanese uh, had a, a program at school. It was not public, but at three o'clock, the uh, Japanese teacher would come in and start teaching mm -hmm. Japanese. And so she got into that program when she was that age, and she turned out to, to like that and got a career teaching Japanese. Oh. And so it, it, it uh, has benefited me, but it has also opened up some avenues of opportunity for my family okay, that cool. never, never existed before. And of course, so uh, in Hawaii, we have you know, Chinese, Japanese, and all kinds of people. So the uh, thinking and the way people act is a, a bit different than uh, mm -hmm. than than, than uh, here. And so, while my daughter is an African American and she went to school at Georgetown, the it, she had some interaction with other African Americans. But having such a wide variety of opportunity working with other people. Right. Her thinking is so a little 
Well, she's African American. It's it's not like uh, people who grew up here. So so mm -hmm. she had to make some little bit of adjustments, according to that. And part of it was uh, she uh, has some friends, and uh, she's not typical African American. I mean, in terms of how she looks and everything, but how she thinks and mm -hmm. behaves is not. Uh, exactly as, uh, like the others so that who, who just lived in uh, mainland U.S. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it took some adjustment on her part, but but she's kind of adventuresome too. And uh, when she was in the Washington area, she called up one day and said she was a messenger. I said, "What? Yeah, I'm a messenger." I said, well, "What do you mean a messenger?" Oh, uh, messages come in, and I ride my bicycle to, to <laughs> deliver them. And uh, what? And and uh, she said, "Well, sometimes when you're coming down there, and the car's coming like that, you gotta lean. Oh. <laughs> you gotta lean this way." I said, "Girl, what what are you doing?" <laughs> and, and so after she told what she was doing, oh wow, I was. Uh, Frightening for her, but she didn't have an accident. But she's that's too adventuresome for me. <laughs> but she managed uh, to survive that. And that's how your parents felt when you took off on the motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, she's doing this uh, delivery messages in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Oh, she uh, going in between cars and. Uh, uh, meeting somebody, another motor, uh, uh, bicyclist, one lean, one win, one lean, so. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> well, this has been, as I said, an honor and a real pleasure for me to interview you. And to conclude, I'd like to thank you for your commitment to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Agricultural Research Service. And um, acknowledge the uh, international impact you've had oh, thank you. um, to make the lives of many better. Yeah, thank and you. I'd also like to thank you for your service to our country. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. I, I thank ARS and USDA for uh, allowing me to work for the department. Oh, it's been exciting for me too and uh, it has created opportunities from a family and uh, that never would have happened otherwise. Yeah. So I, I share you. that feeling. I've worked 41 years with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Yes, yes. And it, it is an opportunity and yeah. um, a privilege, really. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. Uh, and so, uh, actuality, I could be back in Arkansas. The, there was a provision in the uh, contract when I started to work that allowed me to, to uh, they would sell my house and move me back to Arkansas. I said, no, no, no that's, that's okay. I'll, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just stay did. right here <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and uh, deal with some of the kind of stuff that's happening now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Chinese and Japanese and so forth, and um, uh, people are coming to Hawaii and all, and the houses and so high in price, condominiums mm -hmm. are going up all over the place. And uh, but I'll, I'll just stay on where I am till my life allocation ends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I uh, thank you for. Uh, this opportunity. Yeah. It, it, overall, uh, I, I'm happy. If if it had had not been for the nipplings and the, <laughs> these fruit thought things, uh, uh, I wouldn't be here. As a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for your service, and thank You're you for being tolerant with me to to still schedule everything. I didn't. Sure, we wouldn't have met. Well, it's, you're it here is, and it was a great experience, and it'll. Yeah. It'll be a good yes. um, 
interview to share with people into the yeah. future and hopefully inspire some young entomologists. Yes, well, I hope so. I hope so. Thank all of you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I really you. appreciate mm -hmm. your support and your help.